welcome to week two lecture, and the topic for this week is punishment of offenders. Punishment uh, over the um, ages has uh, evolved in many different ways. Um, first off, um, the early um, times of uh, Middle Ages to the American Revolution, um, we saw signif significant um, changes in code. Um, some of the earliest codes was the Sumerian Law of Mesopotamia, and probably the most well-known, um, well-preserved, was the Code of Hammurabi, which was an ancient code that dated back to 1754 BC, and at that time was the oldest deciphered writings of length in that time. At the center of this was 282 laws, um, which were scaled specifically for punishment um, and truly embraced the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth um, approach. These codes um, established status, um, specifically between slave versus free man. And then one half of the codes were the matters, quite honestly, were regarding contracts, establishing wages um, to certain laws. Um, draconian, which uh, continued to evolve, um, was uh, laid forth and established early um, aspects of Athenian constitution and really provided if then um, expectations of the people. Um, as well as the law of the Twelve Tables that evolved into um, early uh, Roman Empire that established the first codified expectations of society. Um, the Justonian Code was an evolution of that that further um, continued to evolve and establish those um, best practice um, elements moving forward. From there, we moved into the age region, and, and the first time that we started to talk about what we consider correctional reform. Um, this enlightenment period really moved us um, to look at things with a more liberal approach. Um, it introduced rationality, equality amongst all people. It looked at individualism um, uh, of the person and really started to spark the idea um, that we needed to have a more equitable um, methodology and the establishment of punishment and this first concept of correction. Um, that concept of correction is can we change the behavior um, that the people are demonstrating at that time um, that is not appropriate um, or not tolerated by society at that time? Were there methods to correct that um, through various ideals? One of the foremost as part of this um, early was Cesar Beccaria um, and the classical school of thought. He first introduced the concept of utility. Um, what is um, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people? Um, he further established the rational link between crime and punishment. He wanted to take a closer perspective on why crime occurs and that crime should connect to the level of punishment. Um, that's this, this hint of, uh, of utility and equal um, application. As part of this, he developed six principles um, that he created to establish um, his mindset um, as part of the classical school approach. Of those were six principles that uh, he established. First, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Truly establishing the parameters for society that brought about the greatest um, joy and happiness um, while limiting um, the, the, the adverse impacts of, uh, of society. Um, in his perspective, number two, crime is an injury to society. It's not only an injury to the person that um, uh, was directly impacted by, um, but it also um, impacted public safety and reduced uh, the safety people felt. Um, so he believed crime had a greater impact than just the specific person. Um, third, he looked at the prevention of crime. What were the methods that society could put into place um, through deterrence, through well-established expectations, through education that would help prevent crime? Next, he looked at that uh, the accused had rights. Um, that they should have individual rights of expectation, of due process, um, the ability to be heard, um, to be fairly judged, that facts drive decision-making, that their status or their economic wealth 
um, would not play a part in this. Um, this was the early concepts of what you would know and now recognize as part of the American legal system. Um, fifth, deterrence is a punishment. He truly believed that um, both general and specific deterrence would have uh, an impact um, to reduce crime. Um, this is especially true with pro-social um, populations that do respect um, the nature of deterrence and have often um, many things to lose that um, that will work. The challenge we've, uh, we've learned over time is that deterrence um, does not necessarily impact crime because those that engage in criminal behavior um, on an ongoing basis have a very different perspective um, of their way of life and their rational um, calculations of, um, of utility are far different than pro-social when you look at antisocial people. And then lastly, um, Mr. Precarious looked at imprisonment and, and how that should be applied. Um, very specifically that um, the, crime, the punishment should fit the crime and that he wants uh, an equitable um, application of punishment no matter what that is um, and it should uh, be equally um, given across all populations. Moving on from that, uh, Jerry ben um, Jeremy Bentham, I'm really brought about the concept of utilitarianism. I'm really looking at the whole and the concept of welfareism. Um, he really advocated the individual as a primary um, economic freedom. Um, additionally, a separation of the church and state, which was a significant problem at the time, um, where, where church law um, really invaded um, the aspects of um, equality. And if you did not belong to that church, um, you are obviously and potentially would not be treated uh, as an equal. Additionally, he looked at the freedom of expression. Um, he really was purporting um, equal rights for women, um, the right to divorce. Um, uh, he also looked at the abolition of practices to include slavery um, and was very much um, an abolitionist for a de death penalty. Um, and he really started to advocate and truly set the standard for what we know um, of many of our individual legal rights today. Um, as part of that concept, he truly represented the fact of deterrence again um, and prevention as well as, um, as his counterparts, um, Cesar Vicaria, um, that uh, these two were a core element of an overall strategy to meet, uh, meet the, the, the foundations of crime prevention. So moving into that backdrop, um, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, really the purpose of corrections at its core. Um, you know, as we've evolved, retribution still has a strong place um, in American society. And looking at um, how it works um, as, it re as it relates to punishment. Um, of course, deserve punishment for the crime. Um, society establishes what is inappropriate behavior. Um, many crimes, um, we all can agree are of uh, significant nature, but there's also many laws that are, are put into place um, to um, have folks uh, avoid certain behavior that society has deemed as inappropriate. It may not um, rise to the level of uh, murder, rape, kidnapping, but it still is, is creating a, a challenge um, for good uh, um, public order. Um, retribution clearly has the, the concept of eye for eye, two for a tooth, going back um, to the Code of Hammurabi and the early codes of Mesopotamia. It still resonates today with our population, um, both from uh, how we codify our law, um, how we sentence, um, it's still very much a part of that. Um, and as, as we can all imagine, emotion is a, is a significant piece um, of our criminal justice system. Um, what the victim occurs, what the general public will occur, and he really has found a way into how we sentence and punish um, um, the offender population in today's systems. Um, retribution also helps society uphold certain standards. There's that deterrent effect. Um, it allows for the opportunity to pay debt back to society, um, whether that's in a monetary way or in a punishment way. Um, and this concept of just desserts, which is still very much an American um, perspective that uh, you truly uh, deserve um, what you've um, uh, 
you've gotten due to past behaviors. Moving forward with that purpose, we talked uh, briefly about deterrence, general deterrence is specific, general is, is just the general fact that um, we have laws that um, um, have an abolition of certain behaviors um, and that most can be applied across the, the board. Specific deterrence um, speaks more to those very specific ex expectations like the death penalty, imprisonment, um, that have a very um, uh, specific um, requirement, for lack of a better term. Um, but also the challenge with deterrence, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, this assumes people are thinking rational, that they think from a pro-social mindset, um, and that that um, will pervade all citizens. Um, what research is telling us today that that's not the case. Antisocial um, people with um, truly ingrained antisocial attitudes and orientations do not see the world the same. Um, imprisonment, um, jails, probation, whatever the application, um, they don't necessarily see that as, as a deterrent to their ongoing criminal behavior. They have a different calculation, they have a different um, uh, pain and pleasure um, calculation. Um, for our deterrent to work though, uh, it must be fast, certain, and severe. Um, that has proven to work very effective with offender populations today. Um, that their behaviors, um, if addressed quickly through um, rapid accountable methods, um, that your accountability meets um, the behavior and that it provides just the right amount of um, uh, severity um, where their that resonates with the offender population. In my many years in probation, parole, and other um, correctional systems, um, we have found um, this to be very, very successful. And um, we call it firm, fair, and consistent in the application of rules. It needs to be rapid. Um, it needs to be swift and certain. Um, so you, there's no lingering um, doubt or expectation of what uh, what what needs to occur. Moving from that, incapacitation, which is another key element of the purpose of corrections in the American system. Um, and this is probably the one that we've embraced the most over the last several decades. And it's the one that's most easily um, delivered and approved of. Um, as you can imagine, since the, the 1980s, we've seen a rapid expansion of um, incarcerated growth in this country. Um, the war on drugs, um, the changing in sentencing laws where our capacitation became a, a primary public policy um, in the addressment of um, crime over time. Um, also, this eliminates their ability at the core to continue further crime. So a very simplistic approach to it is if you put someone in jail or prison, um, they will not have the opportunity to continue to commit crimes. The challenge is what do you do with them? How long do you keep them? And do you address any reason for what um, their behavior, what generated their behavior, what we call um, criminogenic factors? Um, just imprisonment has proven to have a negative impact on continued criminal behavior. If we lock people up and do nothing with them, um, when they get out, because we can't keep them forever, um, they actually you see rises in ongoing criminal behavior. Um, part of this, um, obviously, is imprisonment, uh, execution for the worst and most heinous crimes, um, particularly murder. Um, and we've gotten kind of interesting with our, our selective, as, as the concept here, selective incapacitation. And then we apply that equally. Probably one of the most astonishing facts um, that we've seen over the last um, several decades is a crime rate that is going down, an incarceration rate that's going up, so we're saying, okay, if we're arresting people, crime go down. But the reality is um, not much has changed and crime is going down. But here's the most interesting fact. Um, the average length of stay in, in our prison systems for a violent crime um, is about 47 to 48 months. That has not changed um, over almost three decades. The flip side of that for nonviolent crimes, specifically those with drug problems, um, we've seen that go from an average of 24 months um, to almost an average of 47 months. It's almost double. Um, so through our war on drugs, through our aggressive um, first-time 
um, incarcerated uh, laws and sentencing practices would have literally doubled the length of stay for nonviolent criminals. Um, that goes to that lock them up, throw away the key. Additionally to that, you'll see significant areas of um, public policy in the areas of three strike rule enhancements that have taken a very aggressive approach to any behavior um, that they've deemed um, inappropriate um, and a lot of times um, nonviolent in nature um, and just stacking um, sentencing um, uh, years onto these folks. So from that we moved left. Um, rehabilitation is, is now at the core in those systems of corrections across the country. Um, we've realized that uh, we can't uh, build prisons um, as a, a, a primary public policy. And, and the reality is, no matter where you fall philosophically on this topic, um, it's just not sustainable. Um, the uh, economic crisis in 2009 has created um, a true vision both for local, state, and, and in some respect, um, federal, that uh, we cannot afford um, to sustain uh, an incarcerated first mentality. Um, so we have to think differently. Or, and, and what you're seeing in many concepts is to think smarter about many of these things. Um, so that obviously is the goal of restoring that, that victim to society um, in a way that they're better suited, they're prepared um, to engage in a pro-social life. Um, much of that is focused around vocational education and treatment options. Um, looking at, you know, as in most systems, I can give you an example here in Idaho, about 70% of all that come um, before the, the correction system here um, have a significant drug or alcohol problem. Uh, methamphetamine, alcohol, marijuana, um, and, and a growing epidemic now uh, up late with the heroin, um, that, uh, that's a major factor in their ongoing criminal behavior is the pursuit of their addiction. But it's proven, and the research is, is getting better and better, that if you engage and address those criminogenic factors, um, like criminal thinking, attitudes and orientation, the people they spend their time with, um, who are potentially of criminal orientation as well, these are all factors that we can impact and reduce the prevalence of ongoing criminal behavior. Um, and as I've spoken of, um, this is a shift to a focus on the offender. Um, which is not an easily sell in a, in, a, in a predominant crime control mentality where incarceration was often our first approach. Um, we've got to shift it because the reality is most of these people are going to get out. And as an example, in here in Idaho, um, more than 96% of our people will leave our system. Um, our average length of stay is about 28 months. Um, so they're coming back to our communities. So it is in our best interest um, to provide them um, those opportunities that will address um, the, the thinking and the behaviors that uh, brought them before us in the first place. And as I mentioned before, there's definitely an inconsistent um, um, relationship between crime and sentence. Um, some of the most similar work that's coming out um, for the Center of State Courts is they found that um, length of stay or length of their sentence, determinate sentence, has no impact on their ongoing criminal behavior once released. Um, there were studies looking at um, demographics of same type of offender, same type of crime, age, um, economic status. One would receive four years for a drug crime, one would receive ten. Um, when either were released, they recidivated at almost the same rate. Um, so that length of sentence has no deterrent effect if you're not addressing certain issues. So how long they stay in an incarcerated setting really does not impact crime overall. Um, and <clears throat> Many systems are moving away from the concept of a fixed sentence. They want it to be based on what the system's identifying as the issues, is the offender addressing those issues. And many systems you'll see that still embrace a discretionary release policy um, have this in place. So, many of the new approaches we're starting to see um, to punishment. Um, and this concept of restorative justice, which is really kind of what I've led to um, to this point, is how do we restore them? We still hold them accountable. We still punish them um, equitably based on the severity of crime and impact to the community. But we've got to find a way to get them back um, in our communities, reconnected with the support systems, reconnected with their families, and, and, and show them a way to become pro-social once again. 
And again, obviously that focuses on the offender, the preparation of them, addressing those criminogenic factors that have, have uh, caused the most damage in society and, and trying to, to help them better understand um, better ways to deal with stress and cope with challenges in the community um, as well. Obviously, one of the better aspects of restorative justice was a, was a renewed um, support of the victim, not only in the process um, from, uh, from uh, reporting of a crime um, to the trial, supporting the victim, helping them understand and giving them a voice, and then obviously through the punishment, providing them some closure and some justice, um, whether that's in monetary forms or just in some level of punishment. Additionally, we have to engage the community. Um, the community has to be a part of the solution. It's not just a criminal justice problem. Um, we have to understand that uh, there are social systems that have to reconnect education, faith-based, family, and the greater community have to be engaged in this healing process um, to restore them in the community. And, and don't look at that as a sympathetic approach to this because it's not. It's an approach that um, the reality is if we don't do this, um, they'll continue to come out and prey upon us, and, and we're back into that cycle. And obviously, our, our primary goal in the criminal justice system is to reduce victimization, um, as well as ensure public safety. And then lastly, and as part of these new approaches, we're seeing a greater and greater reliance on looking at the science, on looking at those correctional interventions, those correctional practices that bring about um, the most change in offender populations, that reduce recidivism, um, that uh, enable us to address even the most severe um, crime pattern or crime um, ideology. Um, there are very specific manners in which to address this, and we'll talk more about that throughout the semester, of course. Um, but really, we need to embrace what we have proven over time as the greatest impact and is often the best use of our resources. Some of the forms of criminal sanction, um, and I'll touch upon these and we'll go into greater detail as we progress, of course. Um, it's probation, which is the first and, and foremost. It's, it's still the most widely used application. Um, for those that have greater needs in the community, we can utilize intensive probation, which is just how it's an enhanced um, reporting requirement, expectations, accountability. Um, restitutions and fines, again, it goes back to the, the concept of restorative justice. Um, to apply um, uh, trying to make our victims whole through uh, meeting any financial um, uh, obligations or loss, as well as fines to help the system fund itself. And we want to have some level of accountability for the offenders um, to be responsible for their behaviors, and that, and that includes in a fiscal way. Community service is just a method of accountability. Um, to hold them responsible, but also to give something back to the community um, through some kind of community work, cleaning highways, you know, painting schools, working with the elderly, whatever is appropriate and needed um, as part of their punishment, for lack of a better term. And then lastly, um, the application of treatment and programs. We want to make sure um, that we're addressing addictions, mental health, um, overall health, criminogenic issues that lead them to criminal behavior, um, and programs that support them in a community um, of all fashions, depending on their needs. Some of these very specific as part of this is uh, day reporting, which is a day-to-day -day check in um, for offenders to be accountable. Um, this is especially um, effective when uh, offenders are transitioning from jail to prisons. It allows them to check in, uh, report their activities. Usually they're on a job search, they're looking for housing, um, they're connecting with uh, treatment and programming services, but there's an accountability piece here on a day-to-day -day basis. While they don't necessarily live um, in custody, but this has a heightened approach. Another option that's uh, used more, more or less on uh, house arrest, it's used quite a bit with juveniles and low-risk offenders. Basically it's just putting them in their homes um, controlling their um, ability to lead. Um, this is often uh, attached with some kind of electronic monitoring device. Um, so their, their, um, their times that they're leaving and returning um, are monitored. Um, we have more sophistications using GPS and we can really look at where they go. Are they leaving to go to work? Are they leaving to go to treatment? Are they leaving to do approved activities? And then we can also, on the flip side of that, monitor whether they're going places that they shouldn't be. 
um, that allows us to look at that. Halfway houses is just another kind of supportive living. Um, this is especially um, effective with um, addicts and alcoholics um, because we can put them in there. Many of these halfway houses are 24-hour uh, managed and supported, a lot of groups, um, a lot of support services like AA, NA um, are provided here to continue to help them uh, address their sobriety and hold them accountable. While it's not to the extent that an incarcerated setting would be, but it still adds a, a heightened expectation and accountable. Um, some of the others, boot camp, which is somewhat losing favor. Um, we're moving away from that true boot camp model, but moving into an intense treatment opportunity in a, in a sequestered setting um, for a brief period of time, 90 to 180 days. And um, that's really um, has some flavor around the country here in Idaho. We call it retained jurisdiction. Um, where they have 90, 100, 180, and up to 270 day option depending on the severity um, of their need and their risk, obviously. But it significantly reduces the length of stay, gets them back in the community, reduces that disconnect from their families and from society in general because the longer they spend away um, from society, those connections get weaker and weaker and more difficult to reconnect. And then lastly, of course, jails and prisons. Jails provide much of our short term um, uh, accountable for misdemeanors and others, uh, but also it's the, the first step to a, an extended period of incarceration. And then obviously prisons is where we, we, we place long-term um, clients. And lastly, what we're seeing um, uh, in many of this uh, from the incarceration standpoint is, is a move away from um, this real incarcerated specific um, approach. But to better understand that, you need to understand what incarceration is made of. Um, we have uh, we have determined sentences, which is usually the fixed portion um, of time that is is spent based on severity of crime and other factors that are determined by the courts, and then that is the fixed period or the determined time that they will stay in an incarcerated setting. There's no option. There's no way um, to remove that, and then from there they would move into their indeterminate period. Um, as an example, you know, for a, a uh, possess, simple possession charge, um, the most often um, incarcerated period in Idaho is one year fixed um, and five years indeterminate, or four years indeterminate with a total of five. Um, that's a very common. Um, often that is suspended and they're placed on probation, but that time still is, is over their head. So if they're on probation and they're not successful, the judge can impose that determinate period and they'll go serve that year. Um, the indeterminate, um, when the judge places that, then becomes a period of time that the correctional department, working with the probation or with the parole, pardons and parole commissions across the country, then have discretion on whether to release someone as part of that independence, that in, in, indeterminate period. Um, and that's really based on behavior. If they're successfully completing programs, they're controlling themselves, they have no disciplinary issues, then paroling opportunities are usually accorded to them. Um, and many systems are moving to <coughs> concepts of presumptive sentences, which means that there's going to be a, a period of time served, a period of time supervised, um, with very little um, uh, impact um, of the offender themselves as well as mandatory sentences that are saying, for this crime, you will serve this time, and then you will get out. Um, it's not based on any discretionary responsibility of a pardons and parole. And, and, and the downside of both of these approaches um, is that it doesn't promote offender change. It just says, based on this crime, this time you're going to do, and then you're out. Um, no matter how you really perform, unless you um, um, do something so heinous that you get another charge, and then you're resentenced, um, absent that, um, there's no incentive to make changes to, uh, you know, to get your education, um, to work on job skill development, um, or address those criminogenic factors um, that have brought you before the system. Um, so those are some of the challenges. Um, that kind of wraps up our lecture. Um, I appreciate you taking the time and listen. Um, please use this as part of your preparation for these activities, and I uh, look forward to talking to you next week.